What if I told you that the answer to dramatically increasing topsoil depth, soil carbon and fertility could be a machine? Meet the ingenious Aussie farming family behind the soil key soil regenerator. Let's find out how it works and have a look at some of the results. <laughs> G'day Niels, how you going mate? Hi Tim, welcome to the Soil Key Farm. Niels, tell me a little bit about where we are mate. Uh, we're West Gippsland, um, we're in that sort of uh, a metre rainfall type country. It is uh, high aluminium clay messmate country, so it's very, very shallow topsoil. And that's sort of where we started and why we started this whole process of improving that. And how many head of cattle are you running here now, mate? Uh, about 170, yep. And what would be the biggest challenges that you faced when you first started farming this place? Um, really trying to grow feed into the late summer. Mm -hmm. and, and late winter that they were sort of really slow up times with the nutrient availability to push pasture through and you were saying you had some aluminium issues there as well yes yeah they had to really dry things off early so right. yeah and um we, we did a fair bit of working the soil putting summer crops in but it just brought more aluminium up and um slowed the whole process down so made it more difficult to sort of finish those summer crops so then you invented a machine to overcome all of those issues yes well we weren't thinking it was going to do virtually as much as it did, but what we were initially trying to do was to plant um, like a, an annual maize or a sorghum into the pasture to actually increase that summer yield without disturbing the whole thing. So that, that was the main instance. But then as we've moved forward, we're rapidly building carbon, getting the nutrient cycling to happen. And um, yeah, there's a, a myriad of other benefits coming through as well. And you showed me um, off camera a core that was taken from one of your paddocks where you've been using the soil key machine for seven years yeah. and a neighbouring paddock where it's never been used. Yes. And the difference in the soil profile is quite stark, isn't it? Yes. And, and, and that sort of coming in into late winter when those cores were taken, like there's about a 30, 40 millimetre depth of moisture in the neighbouring property, yet there's... You know, probably 40 centimetres of moisture in our property. So we're actually capturing the moisture and holding it in the soil profile so the plants can utilise that for photosynthesis and actually grow more yield. So Niels, your machine works in three zones really, doesn't it? You've got a yes. cultivation zone. Tell me a little yep. bit about the cultivation zone. The, the cultivation zone is for competition free seed germination so you've yep. actually taken the root systems out chopped a bit of organic matter up oxidized a bit of the soil as well giving a really good seed bed to start your new seeds which are perennials and annuals to topping up your pasture and getting a bit of a crop in as well so you've got a zone about that wide that's effectively yep. rotary hoed yes. except it's with a hook yep. rather than a flat hoe point which means that you don't get the compaction no, there's no compaction underneath all the trials that we've tested. There's no compaction. It's actually softening underneath from the enhancement of the biological activity and capturing the moisture. So any rainfall is extra captured in that trench as well. So Now, beside that, you've got another zone here. And as the hooks go forward, I was watching, there was a lot of soil spraying out in front. But yep. also you could just see that this ground here is lifted a little bit. You yep, can see yep. when I pull with my hand, you've got a zone of lift yep. just about as wide. Tell me about that zone. Why is that important? That, that's very important because your existing pasture has been lifted up and aerated and loosened a bit of soil around it, which really enhances the growth of the plant that's still behind after the soil key. And, and I'm imagining this would also help capture water as well because we've sort of fractured yes. it but we've kept the soil structure intact, haven't it's we? Intact, so it captures and fills up full of water very easily and lets the oxygen in or lets the air in as well. Yep. Because like you really need to run a system without uh, any fertilisers. You actually need that air, which is 78% nitrogen, that's got to be in the profile for the free living bacteria to pick that up. Now you've also got this zone here that's not lifted and it's quite wide. That's yep. important too for the fungi, isn't it? Yes, so any disturbance in soil will destroy your fungal population and set it all out of balance where the centre piece is undisturbed. So the fungi that's in there before you go stays there and then repopulates out into the, into the food sources that have been created right around it. And people don't realise but it's that fungi that can actually access things like 
uh, bound phosphorus in the soil and actually feed your plant roots. That's right. So how much of the soil profile is disturbed when you run your machine over it? Uh, about 17% is disturbed and that, that is a, you know, you're losing a bit of that carbon by that disturbance, mm -hmm. but because of the sheet composting and the enhancement of the photosynthesis and the sugar exudates, you're up to 10 times the ability to build carbon in soil than has been recognised by the science community. Now I, I noticed when you were running your machine over, you had a flail mower running in front of the tractor that chops up your remaining pasture after a graze. Yeah. And then you're also covering that over with this fine layer of soil. Yeah. That means that you've got an anaerobic environment for that fungi that's in this undisturbed soil to start working on the on the um, pasture straight away. Well, it's on the pasture straight away, and and the inoculation of all the fungi and uh, the different types of fungi from the soil straight to that food source, because you've got your green green matter there in abundance, it helps break all the stubble down, balances that out and converts that fungal food into all those nutrients transformed into plant available nutri nutrients in like three or four weeks. So it really gets that uh, nutrient cycling happening, then that creates your aggregation in your soil where then your soil is breeding and you're getting that nitrogen into your soil profile. Now that's really important I suppose for people that are wanting to put in an autumn crop. Now you put in an autumn crop about 14 weeks ago Yes. and you yep. want to show me how far it's come Yeah. Yes. in 14 uh, weeks. Yep, we can do that. Well so, let's go and have a look mate. Yep, very good. Well Niels, so they say the proof's in the pudding. You bake a pretty nice pudding mate. That's right. Cows seem to like it. So Niels, tell me a little bit about this seed mix that you're using in the paddock mate. Um, we've got sort of annual grasses and mm -hmm. some oats and barley and uh, sometimes we'll put wheat in there as well but you've got yep. your, you know, your oats going to seed here now and your vetch climbing up. Yep. Um, they're sort of dominating at the moment but you'll have a few herbs and some chicory and stuff coming through and favour beans and some peas so we've got a bit of everything to cover seasonal conditions and to cover what's happening in the profiles in the soil and feeding the different microbes in the soil as well from the root exudates out of the different types of plants as well. And you've got C3s and C4 grasses? Yes, yeah, yeah. So and that's got, critical, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yeah. You've got to feed your uh, soil structure to maintain it and if you haven't got enough of those C4s in there, you don't actually get that enough of that fungal population built up. So it, it's when you're wanting to build carbon rapidly, you've got to, you've got to feed it. You've got to capture it once it's actually um, eaten off and the roots are breaking down. You've got to capture that. The, the fungal population is the main capturing part of that. Now it's hard sometimes to get companies to give you multiple seed mixes like that. Where yes. are you getting your seeds from at the moment? Well, we, we use AGF. They've been really good at putting the seed mix together that we want, require, yep. and you know, they'll put it all over Australia for us. You know, anyone asks for it to a rural store, they, they just um, send it out to them under the soil key mix. There's a summer and a winter mix. The real difference in that is you've got your early fibre of uh, rye corn for the winter and your early fibre of millet in the summer. So that really gets early fibre with the high protein that you growing with this crop method. Now your cattle can get a bit hot on this mix yes. so you still do feed but you feed straw yes not really expensive loosen hay and things like no, that. No like we're growing all, all our energy and protein is in ample or too yep. much yep or quite a lot of the time so we need the fiber and the straw to help balance their diet. So you calm them, them down with supplementary feeding yes, rather yes. than heat them up. That's exactly right yeah yeah. So we're going to go now and have a look at one of your older paddocks that you've been soil keying for a while but on the way, there's a bit of a story being told here by the Kaikuyu, isn't there, mate? Yes, like we've had Kaikuyu problems in this paddock for you know, 25 years. Yep. And um, we soil keyed it three years, and we've do, been doing about nine now. But right. Three years, and the Kaikuyu was out of the paddock. It used to be 80% Kaikuyu, now it's completely gone. The treatment was soil key, there was no sprays, no nothing. We've changed the nutrient cycling in the soil and the perennials and annuals are outperforming and no kikuyu anymore. And I keep hearing this time and time again when people change across to regenerative systems yep. and they go multi-species, all of a sudden weeds disappear. Yep, no weeds. Let's go and have a look at the old paddock mate. Yep. 
So Niels, we're in one of the first paddocks you ever treated with a soil key about nine years ago. You've been using it here for nine years because this is the farm you invented the machine on, mate. Yes, that's it. And we, we started in these first few front paddocks and um, really got some good results going and um, been going well ever since. Now there's a fella down here who's pretty interesting I want to go and meet. Phil Mulvey, yes. Yep. Tell me a little bit about him, mate. Well, he's turned up and started looking and researching on what we're doing. Wasn't a great believer of what the results were. Skeptical as all good scientists should be, I that, suppose. That's right, very, very skeptical and came in, knew what he was looking at straight away. You could actually get in the field, look at the, look at the soil. Yes, well, all this is happening great. Went off and researched it and um, it's been supporting us ever since. Niels, we got the whole family and your neighbours here, mate. Yes. Having a look at what's going on in your paddock. Yep. Phil, how are you, mate? Jim, pretty good. Pretty Lovely good. to meet you. And indeed you. I'm going to be fascinated to talk to you. I want to find out about what's happening down there. So, Phil, you're a little bit unusual for a soil scientist. You come at it from a biological perspective. You love the microbes. Y yes, I would, I'd say a lot of soil scientists do, but that's more recent. But I came at it from literally 40 years ago. I've been working on degraded land. And when you've got degraded land, the biology and the organic matter is really important. And it doesn't matter if you're fixing tailings dams in the Tanami Desert or trying to recover war damaged land in Kuwait or the uh, acid sulfate soils of Sumatra. You've got to focus on the biology. So the physics and chemistry can't be ignored, they're all part of the system, but the biology is hugely important to get the system back into production. The biology is like the community in the soil that fixes the city, isn't it? Yeah, look, there's layers of biology you're working with that you want to go well. Fungi is really important, the bacteria is important, the root interaction between the fungi and the uh, bacteria and the bacteria and the fungi is essential. So Sean's got his snake killer out here. He he's pulled it out of the ute. Yeah, he's actually using it for what he's, it was designed he's for. He's using it. Yeah. Can you show me a little bit about what we should be looking for in a hole and what some signs of good biological activity are in a soil pit? No worries. But what I'll tell you about is that Sean found a worm just a minute or two ago, 70 centimetres down. That's fantastic, that isn't is it? Fantastic. That's infiltration. Now, the thing to understand about this country, and, and maybe Sean can can fill you in here a bit, is this should be what we call duplex soils. It's on old meta sediments. So these are sediments that have been baked and really had the nutrient stripped out of them. They're solarium, which means they're very old. And the soil here is basically crap. But something's happened to it. It's been improved substantively. So Sean, what, what did it look like before? So we had a couple of inches of pretty good topsoil mm -hmm. um, and a bit of a gray gray loamy sludgy stuff in the winter and rock hard in the summer for in the next couple of inches and then it was just a high aluminium yellow clay underneath yellow yellow, yeah, yellow i'm not seeing much it. sign of yellow all the way down there okay i'm an old guy and we go a long way down that's almost a meter and you can see we can bring the stuff up from down deep and look at this as you come up and have a look at it you can see that the yellow's gone it's actually quite friable. You can see roots and we're now a metre down. The mottling's almost disappeared and the really interesting thing is because we are here in winter, they've just had 40 mil of rainfall a few days ago. It's not perching, but if you roll it out, you can see, and this is a test that, that, that soil scientists do to work out clay content, it's a set over seven centimetres long, which means it's over 35% clay. Now, I squeeze it, no water's coming out, but it's not hard either. So that's saying that the, the aggregation from organic matter is penetrating into it. You can see the roots, you can see that it's friable, even though it's a heavy clay. Now, digging in this, needs two things. During summer it needs a crowbar in its un unrestored state and during winter you can't get it off the shovel so you can't get down but now with the soil key we're down a metre and we've got a lovely friable material it's free draining through it it's changed the whole landscape because of it so we're able to get heavy rainfall events that don't run off get stored in the soil to carry through a drought 
and because of the organic matter in the water we don't get heavy frosts in fact one of you guys is talking about getting fogs weren't you mm. yeah. yeah so often yeah. we often we see on the way to work on a frosty morning it's always which paddocks are going to be covered in frost and, and which aren't and it's consistently this is a low-lying flat look across the back of this paddock so it should be frosty should be the frostiest spot there is in between the two hills here and consistently for year on year it's a, a low fog no frost in the pasture regardless of the length and it's yeah it's consistent it's not just a one-off thing whereas before the soil key like 10 years 12 years ago heavy frost if you did get one you could almost put the skis on and yeah it was quite frosty yeah See, that's the difference that, that what organic matter does, is the aggregation, it improves water holding capacity, so you increase the amount of water you can store, but mir miraculously at the same time, it allows more infiltration. So you hold more water in your soil for a rainfall event, but you have more water going down to your groundwater as well. Yep. So you, you get this stream effect where the basal, the basal flow during summer increases because of the organic matter in your soil. Mm -hmm. So it really is amazing what you guys have done as a family and, and I congratulate you for it. From the soil science perspective, it's quite extraordinary. So Phil, tell me a little bit more about the importance of your bacteria and your fungi in building that depth of soil. How has that physically happened, mate? Because the soil key, it's only really going in that far. That's true, the soil key doesn't go far at all, but it's got some unique features about it. It actually disturbs 17% of the ground just at a shallow level, but in doing so it throws over the mown grass from the front, or the, or the trampled grass by the stock, uh, a layer of soil, a thin layer of soil. And after the first round of soil key, what you've got is you've promoted the primary fungal degraders. So they're the ones that attack your lignin, which is in your wood, but also the hemicellulose, which is in your stalks. So you need the primary fungus to attack that. And, and that's coming out of that undisturbed soil, that, that sort of it, they're there to start percent with, Yeah, but you've stimulated them. They're the ones that crack the straw initially, and they depend on both the root and the bacteria to be fed. So if you don't have this relationship, then the fungi won't crack it initially and, and then build a glue that aggregates the soil and sometimes humifies or locks up a bit. Then all the bacteria do is crunch it quickly and mineralize it. And that's why I've had a, as soil scientists in the past say to me that root exudates are just coca-cola for microbes they just float off to the atmosphere as quick as anything but you're saying that's not the case if your soil biota is in balance that is correct the issue is to understand is that root exudates are good for the circumstances where you've got the balance with fungi and bacteria you actually switch your root exudates off when you actually put fertilizer on that's evolutionary biology. It's really fairly simple. And the best way I can describe it is that why would you waste time doing something if there's no benefit? So, Phil, we've got a machine that's only opening up 17% of the soil. It's leaving 83% you know, of the soil undisturbed. So we've got fungi in there, we've got bacteria in there. Can you explain to me why it's so important to have a balance of fungi and bacteria in the soil if you're regenerating a paddock? Right, if you just have bacteria, you mineralize, which means you convert all the leaf litter on the top to CO2 and water. And yes. then the... Um, which is the why some soil scientists discount microbes in the soil because they really only look at the bacteria. Correct. But what wasn't understood until fairly recently was the role of fungi. And fungi and bacteria and the root hairs all work together. And basically the root says, I will produce an exudate that stimulates the bacteria to push the fungi out to go and find nutrients and water and bring it back to me. Because fungi break down minerals, don't they, in the soil? They do. But they also break down, hard to break down organic matter, such as lignin, which is the main component of wood and hemicellulose and cellulose, which is that component of straw that sticks up. So if we're cultivating the soil, yep. We're destroying some of that valuable fungi and breaking that link between the root and the bacteria. Yes, you're getting sunlight directly onto it. You're getting highly oxidative conditions. So the 
bacteria don't need the fungi to provide the oxidants necessary because photons and their own metabolism can break the leaf litter down to actually um, create the nutrients the plant might want and on top of that we're feeding them fertilizer anyway so what the bacteria does is it bypasses the step that the fungi do and it goes straight to converting it to CO2. Which is why when people put fertilizer on paddocks for years upon years upon years they end up with a lot of bound phosphate that's not available to the plants. Yes, and a lot going into the river systems. So what you're dealing with is, yes, there's a stored quotient, and, and we were talked, I got lectured about the Q factor back in the 70s, which was that stored component. Yes. But the stored component is stored as apatite, which is a very insoluble phosphate. But surprising enough, certain fungi produce acids that break that um, rock down, that melt it you know, effectively. So they produce an acid that breaks it down, but they've got to be fed by bacteria to do it. But the bacteria have got to be encouraged by the root to do it. So if you're putting fertilizer out, why would the plant waste energy on an exudate, Coca-Cola if you like, why would it waste it on it, on a situation where it doesn't have to? It could just put more into leaf matter. So the secret to regenerating your soils is to disturb only a small fraction of the soil, put in the plants that are there to provide a multi-species environment, put a small amount of oxygen in there, but preserve the fungi and bacteria in the ecosystem that's already there and let it go about its work. There's a few tricks to get it going, which yep. is a bit more than that, of course. Of course. But the, the bottom line is you hear a lot of people saying any tillage is bad. Yes. But um, my wife keeps saying to me um, when the, the grandchildren come in and says, Phil, you need to be disturbed every so often to make you more <laughs> useful. So it's the same with a little bit of tillage now and again. Yes. So you're doing with a occasional acute um, stimulus or acute stress is actually good for the system. But constant chronic stress isn't and a massive acute stress isn't. The soil key applies localised, occasional, um, acute stress, which actually stimulates the whole system. Now, how come the yellow soil is disappearing down that hole, Phil? What's really happening, and this is what makes it so interesting, and why I'm, as a soil scientist, so excited about the multi, the multi-response functionality of the soil key. In this instance, what's happened is you've had both root exudates and fungi and roots themselves push down into it. Right. And as they, if you have a look... So the fungi is following the roots? Yes. Um, but the fungi goes out from the roots. So it pushes out into the matrix. And as it pushes, to make it easier to push out, it produces, it's got a thing called hyphae, which yes. is that white stuff you see. Yes. Now, on the edge of hyphae, there's an exudate it puts out, the fungi puts out itself, and it generally classed in a group of substances called glomalin. Glomalin is like PVA glue. It holds things together. Now that's going to look different to mechanical soil structure, isn't it? Yes. Now, Phil, you really want to encourage farmers and landholders to go out in the paddock with their snake killer and dig a hole. Yes. What are three things they should be looking for, mate? Okay. The first thing is how easy is it to dig? Well, if that's, it's, that's if it's fairly really, obvious, isn't if you, it? If you put the blade in and it only goes that far, you've got work to do. Yep. Right? If you put the blade in, it goes a bit further and you can turn up and, and put the tilt to a side and then you hit a really hard bit of clay, you've got work to do. If you can go down like we've done, easy digging on an old, by an old guy, then in actual fact that's looking pretty good. The next thing is soil pH. Now, look, you can go and buy a pH kit from Bunnings, you can buy ones designed for Australian conditions that have been written up by CSIRO from a, from a group called Inocule Laboratories. I assume you, I can put that on, on... I'll put the link in the description for you. Terrific. So you do soil pH. Yep. The third thing, which is a combination of factors, is I want you to feel your soil. You see how I rolled it. You want to see how that looks. You want to see if water comes out, you squeeze it. You want to smell it. Is it sour and all that? So you, you physically want to be... It should concerned. smell sweet, shouldn't it? It smells sweet, yeah. It actually smells earthy and sweet. If it's just earthy and not sweet, you've got another stage to go. Um, if it smells sour, you've got a long way to go. Because mm, mm, that's anaerobic, isn't it? It's anaerobic. Um, if it's got no smell, then you've also got a while to go. It should have a nice, pleasant, earthy smell. Um, 
And that sweeter earthy smell is when you know you, you've really got the biome pumping for you. Now when you squeeze it, what should it feel like, mate? Well, the trick is, let's have a look at some of this. Because there are different soil types, and obviously they're going to feel different, but what are some general characteristics of healthy soil that we're looking for? You want to see the aggregation when you see it yep. like that. Um, so this is up at the topsoil. Further down, when you squeeze, you, you want to see that the moisture comes on your fingers just slightly, mm -hmm. but doesn't rush out, mm -hmm. and there should be some rebound. So the guys have got more to do here. There should be a little bit more rebound than there is. Yep. Um, but this is a really heavy clay. And it's um, coming along well. It's coming on brilliantly. Nils, congratulations, mate. You and your amazing family have built a business that is making a real change to soils in the back of your shed on the family farm. And it's a story to be really proud of, mate. Congratulations. And we've got scientists involved now, real hard-hitting scientists. Phil, you had something you wanted to say about topsoil. Yeah, when I went to uni in the 70s, we got taught that it takes 10,000 years to build a centimetre of soil. Because that's the, the That's the accepted rate dogma, of, isn't it? Well, it's a, it's a natural rate of weathering. Yes. We obviously erode soil very, very quickly, but to build it from the base up yes. takes about 10,000 years. And so I've worked the last 40 years on mines and deserts and, and in particularly the tailings, dams and waste rock where we have to build soil in a short period of time from the top down. And, and that's what the soil key does. Well, what it really does is you can throw a lot of money and build from the, the top down and the farmers go, well, we don't have those resources. Well, what this does is allow the farmer to go green and stay in the black. Fantastic. If you want to go green and stay in the black, there is a link to Soil Key in the description. There's also a link to a fantastic app that has been developed to make your soils easier to understand and manage. Get onto that app immediately and you don't want to miss out on videos like this, so make sure you smash that subscribe button. And if you hang around after the outro, you might even get a few little extra pearls of wisdom. Done. Thanks, Steve. Beautiful. Thank you. Are you happy with that, Niels? in a, such a heavy clay system like this, to see this sort of response and organic matter that far down, when you can go across to the next paddock and see that it's just done that and you hit that, the heavy duplex clay. This is a slaking clay with somewhat dispersive, which means it's actually pretty bad in terms of soil erosion. It's pretty bad in terms of fertility. So um, this is quite typical of the zone right around the gold, the gold filled countries as you move up into that and up into Mudgee, up, up to the central tablelands. You have a lot of these Silurian um, deposits that, uh, um, that we have our mixed farms on that where the quality is not overly great. The basalt and the granite country is generally a hell of a lot better. Now, with products like Soil Key, it's only been around for eight or nine years. It was farmer developed, it was developed to solve a problem. The scientific community is taking a fair while getting their heads around this and coming on board, aren't they? That's quite normal for science? Yes, it is, actually. Um, most of the innovation occurs behind the farm gate. And then the job of science is to work out why it works and then set up a framework or a recipe, if you like, where it can work on what, what other farms and what other circumstances. Yes. Um, and so innovation in agriculture um, generally with the innovators to the scientists learning and training the extension officers is about a 15 year period. And it could be even longer when you're a disruptor to current organisations and industries. Tim, um, you're, you're right, there is existing, you know, existing providers and things in place that, um, that this could displace and therefore it's not in their interest to see changes, but that's not to say that, that it won't come on board because anything that increases um, money for the farmers, when I say money, I don't mean increases yield because farmers have got two levers and they seem to forget. That they can pull a cost lever too. Correct. And they stop going round and round in circles with uh, greater yield and less and less profit, they can actually reduce their cost of sales. If dad, they wouldn't actually use his shovel, so I haven't been able to get a shovel that goes down deep enough. So, if you have a look, I'm down now a metre and the mottling is starting to come in a bit. And as you can see, 
it's not plastic failure that I'm getting. It is actually breaking, and it's breaking along aggregates. So you can see that we've got aggregation occurring. You can see, not so well, there we go. You can see there's some roots pushing ahead. And that's those, from a metre down. Yes, that's from a metre down. And, and this has been dug, almost, well, not entirely, but mostly by me. Um, so, you know, this is you know, comparatively soft digging. Um, and you're dealing, there's a little bit of char, because char does move down the, down the profile, get taken down the profile. But we break it up again. You can see there's bits and pieces of root in there. And there's no plastic failure. It's actually breaking along aggregation there. So it's interesting that you would expect a plastic failure. Also, as I pointed out before, notice when I squeeze it, even though this is you know, the back end of winter, I'm not getting any free moisture out. And that's showing that, that it's storing moisture in the organic component that's there, which is, which is not overly great at this point, um, but it's way more than what you normally get under natural conditions or under farm conditions elsewhere in the valley. But the other thing to note is that that's allowing water to get down to the water table. 